started. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. <clears throat> Sorry, technical difficulties on my end that Maureen can't save me from. <laughs> Um, evaluate envisions an ATE community in which evaluation is valued, systematic, and used to improve the education of technicians in high-tech fields. And we do this by engaging with the ATE community, um, providing information, expertise, and tools to advance high-quality uh, evaluation. As Maureen mentioned earlier in the chat, we do have the slides and resources from this webinar already available on our website. You can also download them by following the link that you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen. And the recording will be available within a few days and I will email that directly to you. I'm Samantha Hooker. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Lissa wilson Betjo is our presenter today and she's the principal investigator of Evaluate, which is located at Western Michigan University. I want to thank our team members who helped us behind the scenes. Uh, we have Maureen Green again in the chat, uh, Lori Wingate, and our copy editor, Carolyn Williams Noren. We also had quite a few members of the ATE community who were uh, really helpful in helping us develop this webinar. So we'd like to thank Ellen House, Elizabeth Hawthorne, Blake Erbach, Elaine Kraft, Pam Silvers, and Emery DeWitt. And before we get started, I do want to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are not necessarily those of the National Science Foundation, but those of the presenters. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lisa. Wonderful. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to talk with you all again. Some of you we saw at our webinar last month and some of you I met in person at the FORCE ATE workshop in Maryland. So we are really excited to really get into the details today of what goes into an evaluation plan for an ATE proposal. And I'm sure that everyone is just as excited as we are that the new ATE solicitation was recently released. And so I was just so happy to see the commitment to evaluation and having a really robust evaluation plan really remains in that solicitation. Solicitation. So please feel free to bring all of your questions and comments. You can leave them in the chat window on the right side of your screen at any point throughout the webinar. I have Samantha and Maureen who's going to help me keep track of that and they'll go ahead and flag the questions in the back end and then we'll bring them up at, um, we have a few question breaks spread throughout. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and um, actually hide our cameras just so we can focus on the information on the screen. Um, but we'll turn the cameras back on for question breaks. So just a reminder, um, if you were or were not able to join us in June for the first part of this webinar series, Evaluation Essentials for Non-Evaluators, um, the recording and all the resources from that webinar are available on the Evaluate website. But I wanna start today with just a really brief recap to remind you to get your head in the space of evaluation, right? So evaluation, is fundamentally about learning. Learning about what works and what doesn't work in order to improve your project. And then sharing those learnings back with NSF for accountability and providing evidence of the effectiveness of your project. So NSF does require, and still in the new solicitation requires that all ATE projects be evaluated. So they don't do this just to make your lives busier, but because they truly believe in the value of evaluation. Celeste Carter, who is the NSF ATE program director, she says, if you don't evaluate and assess your activities and outcomes, you can't know if the project was successful. Evaluation also provides the project team with data to convince others of the success of the project, as well as contribute to the body of knowledge in that particular area of STEM. I'm gonna call attention to that first part of the sentence, right? If you don't evaluate, you can't know if your project was successful. So as a reminder, evaluation involves four basic steps. First, we're asking important questions about a project's process and outcomes. Second, we're gathering evidence that will help to answer those questions. 
Third, we're interpreting that data that we collected and we're answering our evaluation questions. And then fourth, we're really using those results for learning. So today we're gonna talk about how to craft an effective evaluation plan for your AT proposal. So keep these four steps in mind because we're gonna talk about how to best discuss each of these in your proposal. So at the end of last month's webinar, we talked about that there are two basic paths for procuring an evaluator in the pre-award stage. So depending on your institution's policies, you might be able to name an evaluator in your AT proposal. So if this isn't your case, you'll be able, I'm oh, sorry, if this is your case, you'll be able to collaborate with an evaluator to draft your evaluation plan during the proposal stage, so right now. Other institutions, they don't always allow this and have different um, ways of hiring someone as a contractor. And so this means if you are not allowed to name an evaluator or work with an evaluator on your proposal in the pre-award stage, the project team is going to be the one responsible for drafting your evaluation plan. So this might be a PI, a co-PI, maybe a grant specialist on your team. So I want to start off, uh, ooh, this is supposed to be a poll, but I don't think I turned it into a poll, but that's fine. So I just want to start off by seeing, getting the temperature of where everyone is. So using the chat box on the right side of your screen, just type in whether or not you know your procurement policies at your institution. So will you be able to name an evaluator in your ATE proposal? Yes or no, or you're still not sure. So go ahead and, and type that in the chat and we'll get a sense of where people are at. So I see a yes, still not sure, still not sure. Yes, currently in the bidding process, nice. Ooh, I see a lot of yeses. That's ex so exciting. If our sole source purchase request is approved, yes, Sarah, that's a good thing to look into. We're not sure, Nicholas, yeah. So for those of you who are still in that not sure area, make sure to you're talking with your grants office and really understanding what the policies at your institution are because they do change um, from college to college. So uh, I'm actually really excited to hear that a lot of you have and that you're able to work with an evaluator upfront. So I think that instead of you know really having to write all the details of your own evaluation plan, this webinar is really gonna get you, give you that big picture of what should be in the evaluation plan. So you can really meaningfully engage with your evaluator and discuss how to make sure that that evaluation is seamlessly fitting in with the rest of your proposal, because that's what reviewers want to see. Okay, so like I said, we're going to focus most of today's webinar on identifying and describing five essential elements of an evaluation plan for ATE proposals. So nearly all NSF proposals are limited to 15 pages. So here on the screen, you can see little page thumbnails um, are images from one of Evaluate's previous proposals. So out of these 15 pages, we dedicated a page and a half to evaluation. And we recommend that all ATE proposals dedicate about one to two pages to describing their evaluation plan. So in these pages, you should identify who's going to evaluate your project, identify the evaluation questions that will be answered, describe how you will collect data to address those evaluation questions, and also explain how you're gonna make sense of those data through analysis and interpretation. We'll talk about that more. You should note how the information from the evaluation is going to be communicated, how it's going to be shared, and how the project is then going to use that information, right? What are you going to do with it? And you'll also want to convey a timeline for the evaluation. So you'll see in Evaluate's proposal, we did include the evaluation timeline with our project timeline, as you can see here. So we're gonna dive into more details on each of these elements, which means we're gonna cover a lot of information today in a short amount of time. But everything that we talk about has been summarized in our ATE evaluation plan checklist. So we really hope that this resource helps you to remember what we reviewed today and then really apply the concepts to your own proposals. So if you'd like, you can download this checklist. It's gonna pop up in a second. Let's see. 
So on the right side of your screen under the handouts tab, there's actually a full booklet of resources that Evaluate has created for you all just in this point, right? So in that pre-award grant seeker, and one of those in there is this evaluation plan checklist. And every resource that I talk about or point to today will be in that handy um, booklet, or I guess it's a, just a PDF when it's digital. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with that first element that we talked about, the naming of an evaluator. So NSF does like to see a specific evaluator named in your proposal who has committed to working on the project, but they also understand that that's not always possible. So if you're unable to identify an evaluator in your proposal, make sure to state why you cannot select an evaluator and what your plan is for finding an evaluator when the grant is funded. So the first element that belongs in here, right, identify your project's evaluator if you can. So again, once you name the evaluator, briefly describe their qualifications and how those qualifications match with the evaluation plan for your project. This part is really important, the matching, right? So for example, if you have a highly quantitative evaluation plan, the evaluator needs to show that they have experience in quantitative evaluation. Then make sure to reference the evaluator's bio sketch and letter of collaboration, which should be uploaded with the proposal as supplementary documents. So those documents are not included in those 15 pages. Um, but oh, and the bio sketch now for the evaluator as well should be through Synav. I always forget how to pronounce that. But same as the PI, the bio sketch gets uploaded through there. Thank you. <laughs> Science CV, it's so easy when you like remember it, but when I look at the words, the capitalization, oh gosh. All right, so if you were with us in our last webinar, you might remember Jen, our friend Jen. So we're gonna use her ATE proposal to walk through the essential elements of an evaluation plan today. But first, I wanna give you a brief overview of her idea for a project. So Jen, she teaches at a community college in an urban area that has a growing sector of food and beverage production plants. And she's been hearing from her industry contacts that they need more welding technicians with experience in sanitary standards and hygienic design of welding with stainless steel. So local companies are looking to train incumbent workers in food grade welding and will require future employees to be certified before they're hired. So Jen thinks that this is a great opportunity to meet the industry needs, and it fits perfectly with the NSF ATE solicitation. So she wants to embed training on sanitary welding into existing courses at her institution. Together with the new curriculum for the three courses will allow students to obtain a certificate and embed in the associate's degree program. For these, additions to be successful, Jen also knows that she needs to train her current faculty and upgrade their lab equipment to give students really that hands-on opportunity. So once she has this idea laid out, the first thing that she does, as we just talked about, was to call the procurement office, which details the, uh, which deals with contracts at her college. She also refers to this resource that Evaluate has called the Evaluator Procurement Process Guides. And this really helps her understand where she is in that process and what to ask next. So she found out that her institution will allow her to name an evaluator in her proposal. So her next step was to find the evaluator she wanted to work with. So she used Evaluate's guide to finding and selecting an evaluator to know where and how to search. Then she conducted interviews with a few evaluators until she found someone that was a right fit for her project. So if you can hire an evaluator, if you can't hire an evaluator until you've been funded, you're gonna follow the same process after receiving a green light from your institution. Okay, so the next section in your evaluation plan, you need to identify the evaluation questions. So these questions, they really serve as the foundation of your evaluation. So it's important to consider them carefully and talk with your evaluator in what you want to learn as a project. So in this section, make sure to list the key questions the evaluation will address. 
So these are big overarching questions about the project's quality, impact, or effectiveness that the evaluation will answer based on evidence. So we're talking about three or seven questions, not 20 or 30. So they should be about the big picture, not about specific counts or measures. So you want to be sure to include questions that are about both about implementation and about outcomes. And it's important that the evaluation is clearly aligned with the project's goals and activities. So this is repeated a few times through the ATE solicitation. You know, while this might seem obvious, proposed project activities, you know, they shift and they change as you develop your proposal. And sometimes you just need to make sure that you go back to that evaluation, go back to your evaluation team and revisit to make sure that this plan really um, has been updated along the way with your activities to make sure it matches your activities, your goals and your intended outcomes. So what makes a good evaluation question? Well, evaluation questions should first of all be evaluative. So I know that sounds redundant, but a non-evaluative question might ask, how many students did the project serve? So this question is asking about a single data point. If the answer to this question was, for example, the project served 100 students, could we really determine whether that was good or bad? Well, not necessarily based on this question. Therefore, this question is not inherently evaluative. If we rephrase our question to ask, what was the project's impact on program enrollment? We could determine whether the program enrollment increased, if it decreased or stayed the same since the project was implemented. So this type of answer is more meaningful and more evaluative than just saying that the project served 100 students. So second, good evaluation questions should be reasonable. So this means that questions are linked to what the program can practically and realistically achieve or influence. For example, asking whether the project increased hygienic welding employment in the entire state may be an unreasonable expectation of the project given time or resources. So we wanna avoid evaluation questions that are outside of the scope or resources of the project. Instead, we might ask, to what extent did students served by the project find employment in the hygienic sector? So this question is more suitable to the expectations of the project. I think this, this piece about a reasonable evaluation question is particularly important when we're looking at that um, smaller, small scope project, right? Because that budget is a little bit smaller, the scope of the project is a little bit smaller and the evaluation should be as well. So third, good evaluation questions should be specific. So questions should clearly identify what will be investigated in the evaluation. For example, if an evaluation question asks, did the project increase instructor effectiveness? We're kind of left asking, what is instructor effectiveness? How is that really defined? So we don't want vague questions that are stated in overly broad terms. This introduces unnecessary confusion into the evaluation. Instead, we could be more specific and ask to what extent did participating instructors increase their knowledge about sanitary welding techniques? So this question more clearly states the expectation of project outcomes. Fourth, a good evaluation question should be answerable. And so by this, we mean that questions should be able to be answered given accessible data and resource constraints. So if we asked, for example, to what extent does the project affect long-term persistence in STEM careers, this would require long-term tracking and follow-up with students over years, potentially decades. So this really isn't feasible given the typical three-year ATE grant. Instead, we might want to focus on a more short-term outcome, such as to what extent does the project affect students' interest in pursuing a future career in STEM? This question, it's much more feasible to answer um, within the constraints of an average ATE grant. So finally, when considering the set of evaluation questions, you want to make sure that they are complete and thoroughly addressing the purpose of the evaluation and evaluation users' information needs. So by this, I mean that all important aspects of project activities, as well as their intended outcomes, should be addressed by the evaluation questions.
Mapping evaluation questions to a logic model can be a really great way to ensure the completeness of your evaluation questions. So if you're not already familiar, logic models are a way of visually communicating a project's activities and outcomes. Logic models, they are not required for the ATE program, but they are a really great way to show the overall design of a project, and they can be really useful for evaluation planning. So here on the screen, you can see a few thumbnail images of various logic models from ATE and other STEM education projects. So let's take a look at what a logic model for Jen's proposal might look like. So a basic logic model typically has the following columns across the top. Activities, so these are what a project does, creates, or delivers. Short-term outcomes, mid-term and long-term outcomes. So here, you know, every logic model looks a little bit different in terms of what these columns are, but the point is to succinctly communicate what the project will do and what the changes the project intends to bring about through those activities. So that's really what we're looking at when we say outcomes, the changes the project intends to bring about because of the activities. So as we discussed before, um, Jen's primary activities include collaborating with local industries to understand their needs, developing, con oops, developing content um, to embed in the three welding courses, develop and offer a professional develop for faculty and purchasing new lab equipment. So from those activities, right, we're looking at a new certificate being created uh, and faculty gaining knowledge and skills in hygienic welding. With the certificate being offered and faculty trained, we would expect to see students gaining knowledge and skills in hygienic welding. They also will gain hands-on experience due to the new lab equipment and instruction activities. So that's really important. If you are purchasing equipment, you wanna make sure to talk about the outcomes of purchasing that new equipment or technology. And then, you know, the next step, the long-term, after engaging in these updated courses, we would expect to see incumbent workers and students obtaining certificates in hygienic welding and other students also in the associate's degree program gaining new skills. So both of these outcomes lead to meeting industry needs around staff skills and future hiring in hygienic welding. So evaluation questions about activities they really help a project determine whether they're achieving their targets in terms of measures like student numbers, diversity, or even satisfaction. But it's also really important to ask questions about a project's strengths and weaknesses to make sure the evaluation is gathering information that can be used by the project to enhance its quality. The evaluation should also ask questions about the short-term outcomes. So what changes do you expect to see directly after the activities are carried out? To what extent has faculty knowledge of hygienic welding techniques changed? And then what do you expect are the consequences of those changes? To what extent have student knowledge changed? Maybe their skills have changed. Asking about short-term and mid-term outcomes can make a larger argument about the effectiveness of your project rather than simply asking questions about activity, counts, or satisfactions. So it can be difficult to adequately ask about these long-term outcomes for a project. Uh, sometimes you see this as like long-term impact or um, you see some of those words, but in ATE, where we're really trying to fill that industry need, we're really trying to get students into um, employment, uh, those things are just too far out to really measure within the span of a three-year grant. So you might not always ask evaluation questions about the long-term outcomes, but you wanna get as close to measuring them as you possibly can. So as you can see, our evaluation questions span most of the columns of our logic model, asking questions about both implementation and outcomes. So in your evaluation, you want to make the strongest argument possible about the effectiveness of your project. Consider what types of information would convince you as a scientist whether the project has been successful or not. 
So I know this was covered pretty fast, but Evaluate does have a number of resources on logic models and evaluation questions that can really help you put this into practice. So first we have a logic model guide and template for ATE projects. So these include question prompts and examples of outputs and outcomes. Um, the template is also a usable PDF that you can download from our website. Um, there are little shapes that you can type in and build your own logic model. We also have a webinar recording that focuses just on the full hours on how to integrate a logic model into your funding proposal. So the recording slides and additional materials for that are also available on our website. Finally, for more information about what makes a good evaluation questions, you can see the evaluation question checklist. So this provides more details on the definition of criteria for good evaluation questions that we talked about. And finally, for those of you who are attending the high tech conference, uh, my notes say in July, but it is next week, my gosh. So Evaluate is going to be running one-on-one -on -one logic model clinics. So if you're interested, you'll be able to sign up to spend some time with myself or another team member on Evaluate to really walk through your project's logic model or your evaluation plan. Okay, so I know that was a lot. I'm gonna stop here to see what questions you have about uh, applying this to your proposal. Okay, and right now uh, we don't have any questions, but we'll just give you a moment. If you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat and we'll go ahead and uh, ask Lisa. I think okay. what's, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say what's funny about evaluation questions is at the outset, it always seems simple and straightforward. And then when you really get in there and you start to develop your own evaluation questions, it can seem a lot trickier. So remember those resources are out there to go back to reference. Okay, and Lisa, can you tell us the level of description of evaluation design that's expected? Yes, so I see that you also wrote there, Lauren, experimental, quasi-experimental, etc. Um, so I will say, you know, the primary user of an ATE evaluation is the project, right? So really thinking about the data, the learning needs of the project, what you want to know and how you're going to use that to improve. Rarely do you have the resources, whether it's time, data, um, to really get that ex experimental or quasi-experimental design. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a true experimental design in an ATE evaluation. I've seen some creative quasi-experimental designs in longer running projects like centers or those who have been funded a few times in a row. Um, but there's no expectation that, that those kinds of designs be used, right? You're, you're not being asked to provide causal evidence, right? You're really trying to provide meaningful information to the project for purposes of improvement. Thank you. And can logic models be included in an appendix? Uh, no, it cannot. So do not, if you decide to include a logic model in your proposal, don't put it in your supplementary documents. Um, a few reasons for that. One is reviewers aren't required to look at those supplementary documents. Two, uh, NSF much prefers you to put them in the body of those 15 pages if you want to include one. So again, a logic model, a theory of change, any of those types of visualizations are not required, but gosh, both as an evaluator and as someone who has sat on review panels, they are so helpful. Um, in the solicitation, there is a line that talks about making sure that your project has a really clear vision of technological education. And that's really where I see this logic model coming in, of you being very obvious, um, and straightforward about understanding the levers and the mechanisms within your context that can bring about the change you're hoping to make. And a logic model can help 
put that in black and white for reviewers, but it also really does a lot of legwork in getting your project team and your evaluation team all on the same page. So really looking at everyone's assumptions of how different aspects of your project works and how those all come together. Okay, and how much space in your 15 page project description should a logic model take? Can it also be uploaded and researched? Oh, well, you just answered the supplementary. So I'll say how much space. Should yes, take don't it? do it in the supplementary documents. <laughs> um, the space one is a hard one, right? Because I see so many people who then want to fit it in. So they make their text so tiny and the, the margins small. Don't do that, right? Like if you, <laughs> if you find yourself making it so someone needs a magnifying glass or to zoom in, you know, 500% in order to read it. You know, I think you need to go back and really think about how you're condensing your message and making sure that you're focusing on the details that really communicate it. Um, in terms of space, I think if you can get it to half a page, that's pretty good. I, you know, and a lot of people will push back about even using half a page to a page for your logic model. But, you know, it is so helpful to have that quick reference. Remember, Reviewers who sit on this panel, they're reading, you know, six, eight, sometimes 10 of these 15 page long documents. And then at the end, they need to remember all of them. So something like a logic model or a theory of change quickly turns into this reference point for the reviewer as well. And then, you know, I really encourage you to go watch that other webinar about logic models that really talks through the benefit of a logic model for project improvement, project planning, and for evaluation purposes. Okay, and our last question we have for this break is how long do you find it typically takes to develop effective evaluation questions? Um, a lifetime? Is that an appropriate answer? No. <laughs> I will say, I think evaluation questions, making sure that they are meaningful and that they're evolving along with a project is something that is never quite done. But when it comes to developing effective evaluation questions for a proposal, I do think that that could be done. Um, I think a few meetings would be a good idea, right? So if you're working with an evaluator, Make sure that you are providing them as much upfront documentation as possible. So if you have a draft of your proposal, great. If you're not quite there yet, maybe send them a page summary of what you're thinking. And then they're going to have a conversation with you. They're probably going to ask you questions like, what does success look like in this project, right? Or what do you really want to know? What pieces of this project are you most nervous about? Because I think they can then go in and help point out what needs to be monitored. Another great reference really is that solicitation because depending on what activities you're doing, there are fairly specific outcomes that the solicitation is looking for your evaluation to capture. Okay, and I said that was the last question, but no, two let's keep going. Popped up, so I'm just going to keep them coming. Please do. <laughs> if uh, we are not able to select an evaluator prior to submission, is it safe for us to create the questions and logic models on our own for the proposal? Yes, in fact, you should. So even if you can't name an evaluator, you will need to include an evaluation plan in your proposal, and so that involves um, explaining how you're going to choose an evaluator when you're able to, the evaluation questions, and then the rest of the plan, which we're going to talk about in a second. So again, really look at those, that resource, that checklist of making an evaluation proposal. And remember that you can always reach out to someone at Evaluate because we are here to help. Yes, also we have some evaluators on. <laughs> Can reference be made to a previous evaluation in framing evaluation questions? Oh, that's an interesting one. I'm going to say yes, but I think I would need more information. So Abba, if you want to talk about that more, send me, a, send me an email afterwards and we can connect. OK. All right. Let's, OK. Wonderful questions, thank you. We are gonna have another question break, so remember to uh, go ahead and throw your questions in if you think of them along the way. All right, so let's get into the exciting, I say exciting, they're all exciting, right? 
while I find data exciting, I guess that's not everyone's definition of excitement, right? <laughs> So the next element of an evaluation plan for an ATU proposal is about the data for your evaluation. So this is what information is going to be used, how is it going to be collected, analyzed, and interpreted. So these are all distinct things, but we've grouped them together because we can't really talk about one without referencing the others. So in this section of your evaluation plan, you're going to need to describe what information will be used to answer your evaluation questions, how that information is going to be obtained and from what sources, how the quantitative and qualitative data will be summarized, and then how the findings are going to be used in order to answer the questions. So here, you know, in quote evaluator speak, we have the indicators, the data collection methods, the analysis, and the interpretation. So let's take a closer look at each of these terms. So indicators, these are the specific things that you're going to measure so that you can answer your evaluation questions. So examples might be the number of educators that you served, students interested in STEM, or rates of program completion. Data collection methods, this is how the information uh, for the evaluation is being obtained, right? How is it being gathered? So data collection methods could include surveys, interviews, focus groups, or using existing student data. Analysis is the process of transforming that raw data into usable information. Oops. Sorry. So this might include identifying themes to the qualitative data, producing descriptive statistics like means or percentages, or maybe even statistic significance testing. So although they're often conflated, analysis is not the same as interpretation. Interpretation is what you do so you can actually answer that evaluation question. So to make meaning out of your data, analysis generally involves comparing findings to another group, prior year, or maybe a benchmark or a goal. So let's talk, let's take a look at Jen's first draft of describing her evaluation data. So take a minute to read the excerpt on the screen and consider whether you see evidence of those four elements. So the indicators, methods, analysis, and interpretation. And then use the chat box on the right side of your screen to share your thoughts on whether this description is adequate. So what do you think? Once you've had a second to read that description, do you see those elements we talked about? So Liz says it's not indicating what's being measured, only the methods. Nicholas says, what do they mean by program records, right? What else? <laughs> yeah, Susie, it's a really long sentence. Yeah, when we talk about clear writing, you typically want to stay 25 words and under. I, I can't count that quick, but it was a long sentence. It was definitely not clear, Scott. Yeah, and you know what else? Like, it's just a bit vague, right? Like, this description could describe a whole host of different evaluation plans. Right there, there's nothing that's specific or tailored to the activities of Jen's project. Yeah, I see it's kind of just like this repetitive hodgepodge of everything, right? And it's really missing, like Lauren, you're saying those indicators and who is going to collect the data. <laughs> Leanne, a lot of words to say nothing. Yeah. I, and you know, I, I know that this kind of paragraph, right? We have those quote method words in there, right? Like 
using a mixed method approach and we have quantitative and qualitative, formative and summative, right? And, and you want those words in there, but at the end of the day, you need to make sure that your evaluation plan is saying something, right? And is saying something unique and meaningful about how you are going to understand the impact of your project. So now that I have said all of that, right? You may be thinking to yourself like, whoa, didn't you just say that I have to say all of this information in one to two pages? Yeah, so that's a lot of information to squeeze into a small amount of space. And you're probably not gonna have room to go in depth about everything, but you do want to demonstrate that there is a concrete plan for collecting and using evaluation data. So a really efficient way to present the data elements of an evaluation plan is to put them into a table like this. So we call this a uh, evaluation data matrix, right? Um, I joke a lot that I am, uh, I think tables and matrices, right, are like an evaluator's best friend. It's such a great, simple, understandable tool to communicate uh, a lot of complex information. So let's take a look at this table in particular. So here across the top, you see that I've written out the evaluation question. And then in that first column, you have the indicators that are going to answer that evaluation question. Then you see a column for the data sources and methods, again, for each indicator, right? The analysis that's gonna be used and the interpretation strategy, right? So as you might imagine, using this kind of format, it really forces you to think carefully about the data that you're going to collect, how you're gonna get it, and how it's gonna be used. Right, and so actually someone just mentioned this, the who is going to collect it, right? Yeah, Lauren in the chat, you could add that in here, right? This isn't like a strict template that you need to follow, like make it your own, but make sure you're thinking about how you're communicating the fact that this evaluation plan isn't just an afterthought, that you took a lot of time and effort to think about how this is feasible and realistic, right? and that there are these logical connections between your indicators, your data sources, analysis, interpretation. And then of course, how all of those then connect to your project activities, outcomes, um, and intended changes that you're gonna make. So if you want to put your data collection plan into a table like this, we do have some guidance for you in our evaluation data collection template. I did just say it wasn't a template and now I'm telling you here's a template. You could change it, just a PDF. <laughs> so, but in this resource, you'll see that it includes definitions for each component here. So you can really think through what works for you. So in the next section of your evaluation plan, you want to briefly touch on communication and the use of information for your evaluation. So here, really make sure to identify what reports will be prepared and who will be receiving them. So at the minimum, you should have at least one annual evaluation report in advance of the annual report due to NSF, because you want to make sure to integrate evaluation findings into that report to your program officer. It's also good to mention how frequently the evaluator is going to communicate with the project team to really show that there is a feedback loop. So for our team, for the evaluate team, we meet with our evaluator once a month and sometimes more as needed. So also note how the evaluation results are going to be shared with external audiences, right? So think about who else could benefit from the information. So you are likely very familiar at this point with the ATE specific review criteria, but these checkpoints are really embedded into the review criteria, right? So one, is the evaluation likely to provide useful information to the project and center? And two, will the project evaluation inform others through communication and results, right? So reviewers of your proposal are looking at these different elements. So make sure to demonstrate that they're gonna happen throughout your proposal. I am actually going to skip over this next poll, but if you want to look at it, there are examples of communication and use um, in the slides that are available for download. I just wanna make sure we have time for all the questions. So if you're not sure what communication should look like between the project team and the evaluator, go ahead and check out our communication plan checklist. 
We also have a checklist for ways you can use your evaluation findings. So I know I've been saying that phrase a lot, like make sure to use your evaluation findings. Um, if you are not sure what I mean by that, go check out this checklist. It's so helpful to have these options kind of floating around in your mind while you're writing your proposal to make sure that you have a plan to get the most out of your evaluation. So finally, the last piece that you want to have in an evaluation plan is that timeline for the evaluation. So you need to identify when key evaluation activities are going to take place and show that there's a concrete plan for getting timely information from the evaluation. Again, a matrix, I love them, but it really is a great way to do this, right? Sometimes we see these called a Gantt chart. I just made this in Excel by filling in the cells. Um, but here in this timeline, you know, by key evaluation activities, we mean things like major data collection events, uh, when reports will be handed out, and meeting with the evaluator. So you can also include this evaluation timeline uh, in the larger timeline for the project, right? So either in the evaluation plan section or in the larger project timeline, both are acceptable. So here's an overview of those five essential elements that you need to include in your ATE evaluation plan. So identifying an evaluator, if you can, listing evaluation questions, discussing your evaluation data, how those findings will be communicated and used, and including a timeline of activities. So to help you present the evaluation plan succinctly, right, within your proposal, like we talked about, it's a lot of stuff to put into one to two pages, we do have a proposal evaluation plan template that you can use, and this will really show you one way to organize that information effectively. So I would suggest really using this alongside the evaluation plan checklist. The two really go together. There are a few other places where you're going to want to integrate evaluation into your ATE proposal. Um, and there's technically a question break, but I'm going to skip it. So I want to talk about those different points really quick. So there are four other places where you're going to want to mention evaluation. So the first of these is the results from prior NSF support. So if you or if a, someone on your PI team, PI or co-PI has already received funding from NSF, you're going to need to include this section in your plan. And uh, uh, so yeah, I'm going to touch on this briefly because it might be, um, it might not be applicable to a lot of you, but it can be really helpful to keep in mind for the future while you're planning your evaluation. So this section is where you would describe your previous project's outcomes. So reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work that's related to your current proposal. So often we see that people will just talk about counts um, and outputs and uh, activities, right? Or sometimes even just take, copy and paste their abstract from their previous proposals. But really what reviewers are looking for is those outcomes, you know, uh, specific outcomes and results, including metrics, right? It says it right there in the solicitation. The next section you'll want to integrate information about your evaluation is in the project budget. Oop, skipped one project budget and budget justification. So you might recall from the previous webinar that funds to support an evaluator are required by the AT solicitation and that these funds must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. So we talked about budgets in detail in last month. So if you still have questions about that, go, go check that webinar. But a good rule of thumb is to plan on spending around 10% of a project's direct budget on evaluation. And so this may increase or decrease as the project scope changes. So when it comes to the budget justification, there are a few aspects that you want to make sure to include. So according to the NSF's proposal and award policies and procedures guide, a mouthful that people typically just say the PAPG, there are three main items that you'll want to address. So first, identify the hourly rate of the evaluator. Second, justify the time required for evaluation activities. So this should match the timeline and evaluation activities discussed in the evaluation plan section. 
So I will say something that is new in the newly released 2024 solicitation is a, a line that talks about if evaluation is being conducted by a team of different people, those various team members and their responsibilities as well as their budget should be clearly identified, right? So don't um, kind of mash them all together, but make sure there's a separate justification and budget line for each team member on the evaluation team. And finally, like I was just saying, outline the evaluator's main tasks and deliverables, but remember for everyone. The third section, all NSF proposals require a data management plan. So this is one of those supplementary documents. And here is another place you'll want to integrate information about your evaluation. So this document can be up to two pages and must request the following. Um, but the important part here is that when each of these refer to data, they're also talking about evaluation data, right? So make sure to include, to acknowledge your evaluation data in the write-up of your data management plan. And finally, all proposals should have references, which are separate from the 15-page project description. Including up-to-date and relevant references to evaluation literature in your project descriptors can really help to show that the evaluation is grounded in and building on current knowledge and practices. Also, if you're going to use a specific evaluation approach or instrument, provide citations to support its use in your context. So again, this is something that if you're working with an evaluator, they can really help um, suggest references to include. So just as the details of your evaluation plan should align with your proposed goals and activities, information about your evaluation should be integrated into various sections of your proposal beyond just the evaluation plan. Reviewers really like to see that the evaluation plan is intentionally integrated into project activities, not just an afterthought. So just a quick reminder that all of the resources we talked about today should be in that um, resource booklet available for download. And that I will send everyone um, who registered for this more information about signing up for Logic Model Clinics at next week's high tech conference. So I know this was a lot of information and before we go into our last question break, so if you still have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. But I wanna end with some really specific next steps for you to take. So first, um, this is the first question I asked you all, right? Know your institution's requirements for procuring an evaluator. It's really important. If you can work with an evaluator in the pre-award stage, go find them, right? Search for evaluators with skills and experiences that fit your project's need. Second, really start thinking about what you want to learn through your evaluation, right? So developing those evaluation questions. Fourth, think about what, ident what data you need to answer those questions, right? All of these kind of flow from one another. And fourth, consider how your project will engage with those evaluation findings. You know, maybe once a month you'll sit down and review the data, the monitoring data that you have. Maybe once you have an evaluation report, you'll have an all project meeting where you sit down and talk about what it means, what actions you might want to take from your evaluation. These are really important steps to set you up for not only improving your project, learning from what you're doing, but also making it easier to fill out your annual report to your program officer. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Samantha to see what questions are remaining to close us out for today. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, we have one uh, about budget. Is the evaluation budget rule of thumb 10% on direct costs or total proposal budget? It is 10% of the direct costs, right? Different institutions have varying indirect costs and those can actually vary quite widely, right? And so if you're thinking of 10% of the cost of the actual work that's being conducted, you would wanna calculate that based on the direct cost. Okay, thank you.
All right. Well, I will certainly stick around um, if you have any more questions until the top of the hour. I will just send one more reminder before I hand it off to Samantha to close us out. Uh, just a reminder, Evaluate is here to help, right? We are always happy to answer questions, to jump on a Zoom call. So as you're developing your proposal and your evaluation plan, if you decide that there's something you want to ask, want to bounce off of us, please, please reach out. Oh, okay. yes, I see. I see the two other in there. Yes, I got it. So Susie, do direct costs include personnel? Yes, they do. So when you have your budget breakdown, because there's a really specific template you're going to have to use, it does differentiate between direct and indirect cost. Um, so hopefully if, you, if you're with a mentoring program, hopefully your mentor can help you with that. Also evaluators are really used to having this negotiation, so they can also help you calculate what that looks like. And then, yeah, Beth, uh, so um, Evaluate also hosts monthly web chats. And so this is an open hour of people who are interested in engaging more, learning more about evaluation. And so each month is geared around a different topic. Um, we will go ahead and put the link to that in the chat box. Um, but we would love to have you drop by. So it's really informal, but also just a really great place to connect with others, to ask questions, to hear about others' evaluation and the successes they're having with their ATE projects. Thanks, Beth. Okay, thank you. Um, and we hope that you'll follow us on LinkedIn. That's a really good way to stay in the loop. We have um, some popular posts about resources that we've gathered and um, people seem to find very helpful. We'll keep you up to date on the, you know, any new resources we create, web chats and webinars that we're hosting. Um, and hopefully you'll bookmark evaluate.org um, and that can be a good resource for you as you move forward.